skip, swap, or bites with the cumulative approach. My friend Kim says, rather than viewing your meal as individual components, you have to look at it collectively. I don't want to get the steak and potatoes and the cocktails with the desserts. That's way too much. That's just too many calories and carbs. Within your choices, there are negotiations that have to take place. It's not a free-for-all. You look at the sum of the meal and then work backwards. I will skip some things or have bites of something indulgent. You have to be mindful of not just the individual parts, but of the whole. If I went to Chick-fil-A, I'm not going to order the fried chicken tenders, french fries, and a milkshake and eat all of it. I would get the grilled nuggets and maybe have a couple of fries. At dinner, I would skip the cocktails or skip the dessert. I'm never going to have both unless I had two bites of dessert and half of a cocktail. For example, if I went to dinner and was craving a steak, I love a good steak, I would get the steak a vegetable, not a potato. I would eat half of the steak and half the vegetables, and then if I had a cocktail, I wouldn't get dessert. If I wanted the dessert, I wouldn't get the cocktail. The trade-offs are small, but add up in the long run. Let's say the party was buffet style, and there were steak bites, cauliflower, tater tots, mini chocolate dessert, you name it. In that case, you might have two steak bites, two tater tots, and one chocolate-covered strawberry. If everything was decadent, maybe just have a few bites of each. But what about tastings throughout the day? Some of my tastings that are healthy would be a green spinach smoothie that is sweetened with a tiny bit of fruit, maybe a couple of nuts, or a half of an apple. Sometimes I will not have any fries at all, but sometimes I might eat two or three french fries, says Kim. It all depends on what I'm eating for the rest of the night. So for lunch, I might go to Chick-fil-A and I would have a tasting. I first ask myself, what kind of fries are these? These are not conscious decisions, but it's how I happen to eat. It becomes so second nature that it's not conscious decisions anymore. You have to look at things cumulatively. My husband will say I'm just having a few bites of cake, but he fails to take a step back and remember that he also had a few bites of this and an entire this and an entire that. In addition, with, in addition to being mindful of how much they eat, all the women that I interviewed were also very aware of chemicals in the food they were eating. They would also opt for fresh fruits and vegetables, grass-fed meats, and quality condiments. Kim may be eating a little more carbs than some of my friends. If you look at what she ate in the course of the week, she ate a lot of veggies, salads, healthy protein, and healthy fats. She put a lot of greens in her smoothie, and she likes salad. She doesn't order a salad when she goes out because she doesn't trust the salad dressings at some restaurants. She is particular about the oil she uses. She doesn't like soybean oil. She likes to have avocado oil or olive oil. If she wanted to lose weight, the number one improvement would be to cut sugar and have fewer carbs. When she thinks of sweets, she would say, I sprinkle my diet with decadent foods. One of her best go-to snacks is raw almonds. She says, I rather not eat almonds roasted with oil. I like the raw almonds almost as much as roasted, so I'll just swap. I like the taste of oat milk. I know it's healthier, so I will use oat milk instead of dairy. I'll swap oat milk for dairy because it's a small difference, and I like it almost as much. The power is in the swap. You might think one little tweak isn't going to make a big difference. However, when you add it up, it does make a difference. There are certain things all thin eaters won't swap. It's different for each thin eater. For example, Kim says, I will never eat light ice cream. I know what you're thinking. Why would you swap out oat milk for coffee creamer but not swap with dairy-free ice cream? Kim would say there is a difference in the taste and texture, and that difference isn't worth it. The ice cream is a splurge anyway. She says, if I'm going to splurge on ice cream, then I'm going to have something I love. Also, in her mind, the full-fat ice cream is healthier because a lot of times they pull out the fat and add sugar. She would rather have the fat than extra sugar. Almost all thin eaters will choose more fat than sugar. In her mind, she doesn't eat that much ice cream, so let's make sure it's really good. A different example is healthy almond flour chocolate chip cookies. In her mind, that is a good swap because she is confident that it will be healthier and still taste pretty good. This is how she decides if she will swap or not. For example, if a regular chocolate chip cookie was a level 10, 
on a scale of one to 10 to her on taste. And the healthy almond flour was on a scale of one to 10, a seven or higher than she would swap it, assuming it was healthier. If the healthy choice is only a six or lower, she wouldn't swap. It's not worth it. There is something very crucial you have to pay attention to on the swap. I know for me personally, if I swap something that was just okay for something great, I will end up eating double the amount. I will give a perfect example. I bought these healthy chips one time that were low carb but tasted like cardboard. They were okay tasting, but I ended up eating double what I would have if I had just eaten regular chips. In my mind, I was thinking, well, they are healthier and low carb. I ended up eating double. Decide what delicious swaps will help you stay on track at lunch and dinner and during dessert time too. Not only will you painlessly save tons of calories and see a difference on the scale, but you'll also be taking in more nutrients most of the time. To eat the yolk or not eat the yolk? That's the age-old question. I personally only eat the egg yolks, only because I took a food allergy test and I'm so sensitive to egg whites and not the yolks. The yolks contain a fat fighting nutrient called choline so opting for whole eggs is healthier my friend kelly says when it comes to sandwiches calories sneak in all too quickly next time you pack your lunch try spreading mustard instead of mayo just one tablespoon of mayo can add 90 calories to your sandwich but spicy mustard is often zero but again kelly doesn't like mayo that much so if you're thinking adding mayo makes your sandwich off the chart good then add a little mayo this is so subjective You have to figure this out for yourself. It's a mindset and an approach that you have to customize to you. You have to figure it out as you go. Almost all thin eaters say that the second piece of bread is really unnecessary. Some of them say I like to eat half of a sandwich so they will make a sandwich and give half to their husband and only eat half. Another girl will say I only eat one piece of bread by eating an open-faced sandwich. The thin eater just cut 120 calories and is happy to do it. For example, Kim says she loves an open-faced avocado toast, but she always eats it with a fork and a knife, so she will eat it more slowly, allowing her body to tell her exactly when she feels full instead of scarfing down the whole thing. Wait for your stomach to be empty. When I asked the majority of the people when they ate on the hunger scale, I would say 70% of thin eaters ate when their stomach was growling, level one, but 30% said they ate at a level two, because they didn't like to let their hunger get to the point that they would make them eat too much. The key is to get your stomach to where it's completely empty. A lot of times, people who struggle with their weight have a hard time knowing when they are hungry. So the growling is a good indicator of when they are physically hungry, not just mentally hungry. It's like a fuel gauge on a car. Your body will let you know when it's time to eat the same way a car does when it's on E for empty. The drop in blood sugar that occurs when you're truly hungry sends a message to your stomach to produce that empty growling sensation. I hear people all the time comparing their hunger to the gas tank on their car, but the better analogy is if the tank was completely full of gas and then you took your car to get more gas, it would start spurting out everywhere and make a huge mess and no logical person would do that. Why put more food in when it's already full? Sometimes people can justify putting unnecessary food in their tanks with some form of the following excuses. I never eat like this. My aunt would make Iranian food and every time she'd make it, I would always overeat. I'd justify it by saying, I can't cook kebab like this or rice this good. I only eat this every couple of months. I might as well overeat. It's a holiday. I've been good all week. Even though I'm not hungry, it's healthy. I can have five slices of pizza because I'm going to the gym tonight. I hate to waste this food. It's expensive. That's the biggest thing I've learned about thin eaters. They never eat before that stomach growl. Unlike emotional eaters who eat for any reason at all, when you want to eat before you're truly hungry, that's the time to quote your scriptures. You have to learn to eat when you're physiologically hungry. Your body is hungry, not when you're psychologically hungry. Your emotions are hungry. This eating plan is all about when you eat rather than what you eat. Your stomach growl is your signal to start your eating window. You'll train your body to an eating schedule as you continue to do this. If you don't get a growl when you're supposed to, then you know you ate too much at your last meal. If you're overweight and a chronic overeater, you might not have a real sense of hunger because you're running on fat and your last meal. Keep the amount of food that you're eating small so that you're hungry the next time you eat. 
Don't delay your eating window indefinitely if you don't hear a growl. I found that there's a stigma with people about letting their stomachs growl. Stomach growling is a good thing. Getting hungry is okay. We act like being hungry is the worst thing in the world when it isn't. It's your body's natural signal to eat. Let your body get hungry and then feed it. If you don't hear your stomach growl at least once a day, then Houston, we have a problem. I can't stress this enough. Your first meal of the day doesn't begin until your stomach growls. God designed your body to teach you when it needs food. The sad thing is some people have never heard their stomachs growl because they've never let themselves get hungry. Every chance they get, they're shoving food in their mouth. This can be attributed to the number of things. Our immediate access to fast food, poor eating habits taught at home, depression, anxiety, or soothing with food to avoid addressing other issues. You can start your eating window only after your stomach growls, but you shouldn't eat immediately. This is because you're in fat burning mode when your stomach growls. That's your time of maximum weight loss potential. And you wanna prolong that for a little while. When your stomach first starts to growl, I suggest that you have a cup of black coffee or unsweetened iced tea to get you at least an hour past that growl. You're capable of bypassing your initial hunger pangs and waiting until true hunger to eat. Wait until a couple hours after the growl, if you can. The longer you wait to eat, the further you're pressing into that fat burning zone. You'll eventually train your body to get used to an eating schedule. Mine is noon to 6 or 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Obviously, I don't always keep that schedule because if I go to a nice dinner, then it's usually going to be after 6 p.m. On those days, I might extend my eating window to an eight-hour window, or I might start my window at 2 p.m. with a little snack and be done by 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. If you're not hearing a growl, then more than likely means you ate too much at your last meal. It's possible to go as long as 48 hours before reaching stomach hunger when you come off of a binge. Most people never hear their stomach growl simply because they're constantly eating. They never actually reach an empty stomach. Keep this in mind. You should make smaller meals so that you can reach that point of true hunger. If you eat the right amount of food, you'll be hungry when it's time to eat again. It's important to create a habit of getting hungry. There's one small thing you should avoid when you're eating. Don't drink too much water. Drinking too much water while you're eating your meal can actually dilute your stomach acid and interfere with digestion. You want everything working properly so you can sense hunger and fullness. However, outside your eating window, you can drink as much or as little as you want. Let your body tell you when it's thirsty, just like when it's hungry. When you're hungry, eat. When you're thirsty, drink. Rocket science, right? Use the three bite rule. When you cut out entire food groups and limit the number of calories you consume, you have to rely on willpower to succeed. At some point, your willpower kind of gives up. Anytime I go the route of completely banning a particular food from my life, I go crazy and start losing my willpower. One day, I just explode and eat everything in sight. But when I have one or two bites of decadent foods, I can say, okay, I had it. It was fine. The end. It makes me feel like I can still have what I want. I've discovered that the magic number for me to have the decadent foods I want is three bites. Eating three bites of dessert doesn't make my body respond negatively. This is something I can do to maintain my weight. If I'm aiming to lose weight, then I might do this once a day or not even at all. However, I never ban myself from eating particular food. That behavior can lead to a binge somewhere down the road. Allowing myself three small bites satisfies the craving. Let's say I really want some chocolate mousse, but in an effort to be healthy, I I tell myself I'm just going to have this apple with almond butter instead because that's the healthier option. Sometimes that will work, but oftentimes it really depends on how badly you want it because what you don't want to do is eat the apple with almond butter and say, that just didn't do it, and go eat the mousse anyway. Now you've eaten the apple, almond butter, and mousse. You've eaten all those calories. It's just better to eat the mousse in a small amount rather than overeating. Enjoying food is not a sin. I don't believe your attitude has to be, I can only eat to live. I can't enjoy anything that I eat. I disagree. I think you can enjoy whatever food you want. There is nothing you can't have. You're simply learning how to eat non-clean foods in moderation. 
You don't want to have this frantic mentality that obsesses over every detail about food. Okay, what am I going to have for lunch? I don't want a sandwich, but I do because it has too many carbs. I don't want to have this croissant with chocolate, but I do because it has too much sugar. I don't want a frittata. Oh, yes, I do because it has too many eggs and they have cholesterol. Once again, if you don't have physical ailments that prevent you from having certain foods, you can have whatever your body craves. I have tons of skinny friends who eat whatever they want all the time, but because they fast, they still maintain and lose weight. The three bite rule. Here's a short list of things that are about 200 to 400 calories that would be just satisfying enough during your eating window to carry you to that one meal a day. You can open your imagination to choose things to keep in your own house that would be right for you. Apple slices with one tablespoon peanut butter. Apple chips, dehydrated or toasted. Apple with a couple slices of cheese. Choose the least processed cheese for good health. Baked warm pear with some cinnamon. Rice cake with peanut butter and banana. A banana with a handful of pumpkin seeds or nuts. Carrot or celery sticks with guacamole, hummus, or tzatziki. Celery sticks with peanut butter or topped with raisins like you did when you were a kid. A ramekin full of nuts, almonds, cashews, pistachios. Cracking them is a lot of fun as a distraction too. Half a cup of cottage cheese. A stick of string cheese. A slice or two of sandwich meat like turkey. You could add a slice or two of cheese or on crackers. Mozzarella cheese with roasted red peppers. Half a sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and a slice of meat. A few slices of organic jerky, beef, venison, turkey, or pork. Some quinoa salad. Some quinoa salad with boiled eggs. Tofu salad or a couple bites of firm tofu. A small bowl of lentil soup. A small bowl of carrot ginger soup. A fruit and yogurt smoothie. This is one of my friend's favorites. She loves to throw in all the good things she needs, but might not gravitate towards in a meal like kale probiotic powder, a raw free range organic egg, some flax seed or chia seed. The yogurt fruit combination possibilities are endless. See recipes for smoothies in this book. A couple of hard boiled eggs with or without a little seasoned salt, pepper, or kale flakes. A couple of deviled eggs, a handful of macadamia nuts with two hard boiled eggs, a green berry smoothie, one sushi roll with no rice with vegetables and fish or vegetables and shrimp, chia seed pudding with half of an avocado with vegetables, carrots and celery with guacamole or hummus, a spoonful of almond butter with a handful of berries or maybe carrots and cauliflower, a handful of Brazil nuts and a side salad with grilled vegetables. Got the idea? It's not enough for a meal, but it's just right for curbing your appetite a couple of hours before a meal. Be creative. Mix it up. Sweets. One thing that all of the women that I interviewed had in common is if they started gaining weight, they'd cut back on sugar and carbs. Those two things will add weight if you are not careful. Some people might need to decide to not eat any sugar at all except for natural fruits, which studies have shown is better for you in the long run. One of my friends who is very says she'll have a couple bites of dessert twice a month. If it's a special occasion, she'll have one or two bites of this or that, but not having sweets every single day. Personally, once I start eating too many sweets, I can go down a slippery slope. Therefore, I don't keep them close at hand, but rather stock things like nuts and fruit to curb my sweet tooth. Additionally, I don't have any artificial sweeteners at all. I just feel terrible when I have them. When I eat a meal that's high in sugar, I immediately crave a snack afterward. It's not that I'm still hungry. I just feel the need for something sweet. This is because the high sugar meal I ate caused my blood sugar to shoot up high. So when the blood sugar drops even just a little, I start craving something sweet to balance me out. This is a major reason to avoiding too much processed sugar as it ultimately leads to the consumption of more sugar, which will cause you to gain weight. OMAD and a tasting allows for periods of carbohydrate fasting and periods of carbohydrate feasting, which is called carb flexing. You will learn to carb flex on one day after eating reduced carbs on another day. By adding complex carbohydrates back into your daily diet for short bursts of time, you can feed your liver, which depends on glucose. You can still feed your food cravings. Who doesn't want freshly baked whole grain bread still warm from the oven? What about some fruit, granola, or gluten-free treats? How about polenta, kasha, quinoa, or oatmeal with milk and honey? 
you need to feed your diverse gut microbiome. For many of our friendly probiotic bacteria feast on the starches and grains and beans or the sugar and dairy. These carb function as prebiotics that help our friendly flora modify the mucosal lining of our gut and keep it healthy. Hormones. Hormones are such a big part of intermittent fasting and there are over 50 hormones in the body. Some of these hormones are insulin, cortisol, ghrelin, leptin, and many more. Trying to balance all of them can be overwhelming, but intermittent fasting really helps balance them out. I was just curious how my diet affected my blood sugar, so I ordered a continuous blood glucose monitor. Even though I'm not diabetic, my blood sugar has never been great, but it's been stable. Wearing a glucose monitor helps me see exactly what my blood sugar is. It's one of the best things I've done for myself. If you're interested in learning more about how to get a glucose monitor to work for you, go to chantelrayway.com slash glucose. Keeping your insulin levels is important, especially if you're going through premenopause, menopause, or postmenopause. Fasting for 12 to 36 hours can keep your insulin levels low while tapping into your fat stores for energy. By putting your body into a fasted state and pausing some eating, your hormones start communicating effectively with one another in a way that they're supposed to. It is the number one way, in my opinion, to help you regulate your hormones without having to do too much. However, if you're doing too much fasting, it can actually mess up the hormones and they can get out of whack. Everything has to be balanced. If you're in perimenopause and you're experiencing hot flashes, that is caused by an imbalance of progesterone and estrogen in your body. People say there's a laundry list of things that they experience as a result of hormonal imbalance, such as hot flashes, depression, sleeplessness, mood changes, forgetfulness, frozen shoulder, even up to a year. I even know people who have had surgery for frozen shoulder. What causes this is a hormonal imbalance of progesterone and estrogen. What you need is estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, and insulin all working in balance. It's almost like a thermostat. When you have a decreased estrogen level, it causes your hypothalamus to become more sensitive. When your hypothalamus thinks it's too warm, then your body tries to cool you down. Harahachi Boo. One of my friends at Kimmy is Okinawan. She says Okinawa is one of the world's blue zones where people live extraordinarily long, health, long and healthy lives. I started exploring and identifying the blue zones regions of the world from some of the podcast guests I had on my show. For almost a thousand years, the Japanese of Okinawa has maintained a reputation of nurturing extreme longevity. Okinawans live a long time. Hara Hachi Bu, which literally translates to eat until you are eight parts out of ten full. I was eating sushi one day with a friend of mine who stopped eating with just two slices of her four sushi rolls left on her plate. She pushed the plate back slightly and said aloud, Hara Hachi Bu. She had only eaten half of what was on her plate. But she knew she was done and stopped before the feeling of fullness. Another friend of mine confessed to a similar experience when her thin daughter left a couple of rolls on her plate. My friend, having been raised as a member of the Clean Your Plate Club, reached her chopsticks across the table after her own meal was done and finished off her daughter's leftovers because she couldn't stand seeing good food go uneaten. She explained to me that as they left the restaurant, she knew almost immediately that she should not have taken that one last roll because she didn't feel comfortable. She was bloated and felt stuffed. It would have been better in a takeout container than in her belly. Thin eaters usually leave some food on their plates. They don't finish the food on their children's or husband's plates either. They never feel stuffed like a turkey. They eat to satiety, satisfaction, harahachibu. As I explain in Waste Away the Chantel Rayway, to help yourself recognize when you're satisfied and not overeat, you need to develop stop eating cues. 
It's like training a dog to go potty. I got a new puppy, Gizmo, and we had trouble potty training him at first. So we took him to a trainer named Dory, who told us dogs need cues to learn to relate certain things with new behaviors. The cues can be hand signals, gestures, and sounds. For example, to make Gizmo stay, we held a hand up and said, stay. To potty train a dog, Dory told us to put a bell by the back door. And every time we took Gizmo outside to go potty, to put his nose in the bell and make it ring. This taught Gizmo when he needed to go potty, he should ring the bell to let us know. It's the same with our bodies. We need cues to tell us to stop feeding our bodies. Since I have trouble knowing when to stop eating, I have ways to signal my body that it's time to call it quits. How to put Harahachi Boo into practice. The biggest thing that I suggest doing is to eat slowly. I struggle with this. I eat so fast and I say this to myself all the time, but I get a little better with each meal. Here are some tips that have helped me implement Harahachi Boo in my daily eating practices. Eat more slowly. Eating faster results in eating more. Slow down to allow your body to respond to cues, which tells us we are no longer hungry. Use small plates. Use little ramekins or baby bowls. Choose to eat on smaller bowls and use tall, narrow glasses. You're likely to eat significantly less without even thinking about it. When you're finished with your meal, when you're finished with your meal, chew a piece of gum, brush your teeth, or have a cup of coffee to deter you from eating more than you should. Coffee is a good way to end your meal, but you have to be careful because it can have a lot of sugar in it. Coffee from one of the popular coffee shops can have up to 48 grams of sugar. I make my coffee with cream and no sugar. Savor your food. The best thing you can do to help you decide when to stop eating is to eat what you really want. Savoring your food is easier when you're eating what you really want to eat. I used to consider taking what I thought was an easy route to lose weight, taking a weight loss pill or doing a fad diet. But I realized that the true solution was to eat real food and never deprive myself. To do that, I have to savor my food. Looking back, I'm shocked to often... I'm shocked at how often I used to eat without even thinking about whether or not I was actually hungry. I ate based on how much food was on my plate. No matter how much food filled the plate, I always ate it all. I realized that the problem wasn't with the food itself. Thin eaters eat any kind of food they want and don't deprive themselves. When you eat slower, you taste and savor the food. I personally love chocolate mousse. Since I particularly like the whipped cream, all I do is take a little whipped cream and a little bite of the mousse and just skim the top of it. I use a fork and just take razor thin slices. I'm savoring it. The goal is to savor your food and not deprive yourself of it. One day I was talking to my friend Catherine, who is a former Miss Virginia. We were talking about this concept and she told me that even though she is a dentist, she loves candy, especially Skittles. She has always loved them since she was a little girl, but she doesn't just sit down and eat an entire bag of them without noticing it. She really takes her time and enjoys each and every Skittle. Because she takes her time and really enjoys her sweet treat, just a few Skittles is plenty to satisfy her craving. Really enjoy the taste. See, you're not depriving yourself. Don't rip the bag open and dump the whole thing in your mouth. Take your time and enjoy it. Eat the best first. Thin eaters only eat what they really, really love. I interviewed tons of thin eaters and they told me that they actually taste and rate each food on their plates. The average eater tastes something she doesn't like and eats it anyway because she feels she has to quote clean her plate. Imagine a plate of steak, mashed cauliflower, broccoli, and a salad. The average eater eats the food she likes first and saves the best for last. The thin eater eats what she likes the best first because she knows that she's going to stop eating once she gets full. If she likes the steak and mashed cauliflower, she's going to eat that instead of feeling forced to eat the broccoli and salad she doesn't want. She eats what she craves. Usually a salad is served before the main course of any meal and we eat it. Not necessarily because we enjoy it, but because it's there. When the main course comes out, and be honest, that's the food you showed up for. You eat more of that to satisfy your craving and end up eating past full. Afterward, you blame it on the meat and carbs in the main course when it's actually the salad that's the problem. You could have refused to eat that entirely and waited on what you actually wanted and eaten less overall.
Everything tastes amazing when you're really hungry. Notice that often when you take your first bite, food tastes really great. The second bite is kind of good and the third bite isn't very good at all. Every bite after the first goes down in quality. If you were to rate taste on the scale of one to 10, the first bite is a 10, second bites are a nine, third bites an eight, and on and on. When it gets to a seven, you should be ready to stop eating. Absolutely at a six, you shouldn't be eating anymore. Ways to avoid overeating. Order an appetizer. When you're eating out, order a small appetizer to share is a good idea. Have your appetizer 15 to 20 minutes before your meal arrives. Once you start eating your meal, you can eat with a lot more control because you'll already be approaching that full feeling. Many thin eaters say they order a small appetizer before dinner and share a meal. Set a timer. Set a timer for 25 minutes. Take a couple of bites and then stop. Look up from the food and give it time to hit your bloodstream. Take the time to talk or take a bathroom break. This will give your brain time to register that it's full before you clean your whole plate. Find a meal finisher and switch lanes. Whenever we eat at home, I feel like I don't love what I'm eating as much as if I go out to eat. This is because when you go out to a restaurant, you can have whatever you're craving. If you're craving a burger or grilled shrimp salad, you can have those things. When you eat at home, you can only have whatever you want if you happen to have the groceries to make whatever you want. This is a perfect scenario of something that happened to me. We didn't have many groceries at home. I had enough to make a kale salad, sliced avocado, and roasted broccoli. I didn't have any protein that I wanted at the house, so once I was done eating, I wasn't fully satisfied. I felt like I wanted something else. I ate a couple of pomegranate pieces and gluten-free coconut rice crackers, but because they tasted really good, I felt like I was starting to eat too many. Then my husband came and said, Chantel, stop snacking. We just finished eating lunch. I had to find a meal finisher and switch lanes. The second I started eating too many of those coconut rice crackers, and with my husband's <laughs> gentle reminder, I decided to quickly go get one of the Pau de Arco teas. I have a massive sweet tooth. Every time I'm done eating, I always want something sweet. I have a lot of friends who have massive sugar cravings right after they finish eating too. And the things that help with their cravings are eating more fat, eating more protein, adding cinnamon to everything, having decaf or regular coffee with or without cream, having Pau de Arco or peppermint tea. What to drink. To be true to your fast, you should only drink water, black coffee, or unsweetened tea, hot or cold. Most experts agree as for having coffee or tea during your fast, you should be just fine. Some experts say if you drink coffee with less than 50 calories, then your body will still remain in the fasted state. So your coffee with a splash of milk or cream is just fine. Others will say absolutely not. I also personally believe caffeine also has a stronger effect when ingested on an empty stomach. So it does a better job of helping you battle fatigue and brain fog. This makes increased concentration another perk of intermittent fasting with coffee. Technically, you're not fasting if you add any of these to your coffee because they all contain calories. However, fats themselves won't influence your insulin or blood sugar levels. So some experts say this is the most recommended choice if you're looking to boost your insulin sensitivity if you have prediabetes or diabetes. While you may have heard recommendations for bulletproof coffee made by adding butter, coconut oil, or MCT oil to coffee, be aware that it contains over 230 calories in a 16 ounce serving made with a tablespoon of each fat. So you're adding tons of fat and calories. We have to discuss coffee for a minute because the biggest problem people have with this is that they don't wanna drink black coffee under any circumstances. I have to drink coffee with cream in the morning, they tell me. This is just a must. If I can't have coffee with cream in the morning, this diet is not for me. As I mentioned in Waste Away, coffee is a great way to get you through your fast. Coffee and unsweetened tea act as appetite suppressants. You should not consume any calories while you're fasting, and that includes coffee with cream. Remember, this is not a diet. I know plenty of people that use this approach to eating who are drinking coffee with cream in the morning. Believe it or not, you can still get results. I have an aunt who's 5'4 and 90 pounds and has her coffee this way. She drinks coffee with cream multiple times a day until about 1 p.m. However, she only has one or one and a half meals after that. She eats very, very little. 
However, I don't recommend coffee with cream because I believe it will slow down your progress and keep you from discovering true hunger. I prefer you dig in and learn to take it black or try unsweetened tea instead. 80% of the fat loss battle is controlling your hunger and coffee is a great way to delay hunger until you're ready to eat. Most of the women I interviewed drank unsweetened coffee with a little creamer and still stay very thin. Black coffee is what I recommend. However, like they say, you do you, boo. Remember, you can also have green tea in the morning and maybe open your window at 12 and have a cup of coffee with cream. I want to say that 90% of the women that I interviewed did have a splash of cream in their coffee with no sugar because they just didn't like the taste and most of them had half and half organic or fresh cream. So on the other hand, I've seen people who have taken cream out of their diet and lost that extra 10 pounds they needed to lose just from taking the cream out of the coffee. This is something you have to decide, but I wanted to make clear that the people who were thin, 90%, did put a splash of cream in their coffee. Remember, you can train your body to have black tea or black coffee or green tea with no cream. Another option is to break your fast around noon or have coffee with cream then. For me, what I do is to have a cup or two of green tea in the morning and then around 12, I'll have a cup of coffee with a splash of cream. I have trained my body to not like sugar in my tea or coffee. I know tons of people who have trained themselves to like coffee completely black. I drink black coffee sometimes, but I rather wait until 12 to have a cup of coffee with cream because I like that more and that takes me to about 2 p.m. to eat my first tasting. But as I said, I know a lot of thin women who have a splash of cream in their coffee and are still super thin. There is a timing when you should drink coffee as well. Don't drink it as soon as you wake up. You're not usually starving when you first get out of bed. Save it for later when you feel hunger setting in, but you need to push on with your fast a little longer. That's when coffee and tea are a great help. I recommend no more than two to three cups of coffee a day. If you drink more than that, it won't be as effective in suppressing your appetite. One thin friend of mine told me she is 10 pounds lighter because of the amount of tea she drinks. Anytime she thinks she wants something to eat, she just brews up another cup of tea. Having an electric teapot makes that so easy. Just click a button as you walk by, set up the cup and bag, and then voila, the water's ready. She drinks black, green, or herbal teas all day long. Her favorite is an organic chai to which she might add a little creamy oat milk. That last one would be breaking a fast, so it's best to drink it in the eating window. If you want to learn more about what you should drink while fasting, I cover this in detail on my podcast and website at ChantelRayway.com. Exercise. One friend of mine has always been thin and she grew up with a thin mother who followed all of the same thin eater concepts we've already discussed, but she has put on weight in recent years simply for not moving enough. She still eats very little, but her hips are widening due to the sedentary life of COVID shut-ins and sitting too much. Even as she was doing more baking with her kids, crafting or whatever, she gained about 10 pounds just from not running a bunch of errands for nine months. It's the pandemic 15, like the freshman 15 we all put on in college. Well, for the new year, she decided that all she needed to change was one thing, move more. So she reached out through Facebook to ask others to join her on a virtual walking challenge to complement her thin eating habits that were already in place. A bunch of friends signed up and started watching their collective progress together on a map of their movements. They accumulate walking points as a team and individually. That's a great way to start moving your body again if you put on some unexpected weight like she did, helping yourself and others reach for better health. Adding in walking for about three miles per day is absolutely magic and helping shed pounds. Know your body, know your needs, go for it. Accountability. Everyone really needs a good encourager or team to help them stay motivated. I have a trainer at the gym. I go a couple days a week, and the rest of the time I work out in a small group class. I'm not good at pull-ups, and I really don't like to do them. But when my trainer simply puts his hand on my back when I do them, I can do so much more. He's not really doing anything other than literally resting his hand on my back, but it makes all the difference in how many pull-ups or how well I can do. This is the kind of gentle support we can all use when we're trying to make a change to our lifestyle. Your accountability supporter could be in your family, even like my friend's teenage daughter who reminds her mother that they committed together to cut the sugar back after holiday sweets binging. 
Your accountability team could be a group you schedule walking with a couple times a week. You could join a fitness community to help you stick to your commitments. One friend of mine was part of her corporate downhill ski team throughout the winter when our bodies tend to go more into a slowdown. She loved the challenge and camaraderie while she kept in great shape. Don't be shy about telling others what you're working on. Before you carpool with a friend to a party, say, hey, would you help me out tonight? I know there's going to be a big spread of food on the table, but I've already eaten and I'm not hungry. I'm worried I'll eat for the wrong reasons, and a good friend will help you out. She'll give you a wink when you reach for the cookie platter, but pull your hand back because you know you're not hungry. Mindset. Do you know where you get your mindset from? A lot of your success will come from having the correct mindset. As some of you know, the right thinking can either enable you or it can can completely disable you. I have a friend who told me her mother stayed with her dad, who was an alcoholic for over 30 years. Her mother never worked, and her dad spent all the money on alcohol. The kids ended up having to take ketchup from Hardee's to make tomato soup, and that's what they ate. Sadly, in the mom's mind, she felt like because she had never worked, that meant that she never could. It's amazing what you won't do if you think you can't. It's amazing what you won't do if you think that you can't. For example, if you said, I don't think I could ever do a 24-hour fast, or I don't think I could ever do a 48-hour fast, maybe you think, I can't even just do a six-hour eating window. You are already setting the expectation with your mindset that you can't do it, which is totally not true. Our attitudes are moved by our mindset for better or worse. They are literally the forerunner for everything that we do or everything we don't do. I want to talk to you about getting your mind off the road behind you, letting go of what lies behind and saying, okay, look, it doesn't matter. I've messed up in the past. Be committed to yourself moving forward. Maybe you have eaten more than you should have or you gain weight. Put all of that in the past. Some people reading this are just stuck in a rut. The reason why you're stuck is that you've been in the same place for too long. You've got around the same mountain and you've dug a rut and you feel like there's no way you can get out. Well, your mindset is how you view the world. It's part of your personality, social connections, upbringing, and life experiences, as well as lies we tell ourselves. Personality. I'm going to show you the DISC personality test. For example, if you're an I personality, you tend to be a little bit happier and more jovial. That's just how God created you. But if you are a C personality, you're going to analyze the negatives a little bit more. That's just the way that your personality is. You can adapt and change that number to where you get your mindset from is the way you were raised. You can adapt and change your mindset from the way that you were raised. Social connections. I know you've heard the saying, one bad apple spoils the bunch. I don't know how this particular phrase got its start, but it does have some basis in science. When apples or fruit begin to decay, they actually emit gases. If the rotting fruit is mixed with a group of other fruit, the good fruit can absorb the gases and begin to rot too. I have this wooden bowl in my house that we put fruit in, and I watch it every day. If I have one lemon that goes bad, any other fruit surrounding it can instantly go bad unless I throw it out. Have you ever been part of a group where one person's negative attitude affected everyone in the group? It's so true that one person's negative demeanor, attitude, or bad behavior can affect the whole group of people, influencing them to have a similar negative attitude or to engage in the same bad behavior. Like with the fruit, you have to constantly pay attention to who you're hanging out with. If you're hanging out with people who constantly want to eat and think it's fun to overeat, then those people are going to bring you down. Hanging out with people who are thin or want to be healthy and don't want to overeat is important. Upbringing. What was the mindset you were raised with? Is it the glass half full or glass half empty type of life? Maybe you were raised in a family where you often heard something repeated like, we can't afford it. You might have asked, can I get this or can I get that? But if you're constantly told we can't afford it, then what can happen when you actually do have money to afford things? 
You might think that even though money's not tight anymore, you can't afford it. I have a friend like that who is very tight with money, even though he makes like $50,000 a month in passive income from rental properties. He has told me that he really wants to live on the water, but he just won't sell his house. Even though he has tons of money in the bank, he feels like he can't afford to live in a bigger house on the water. So he has a mindset of not being able to afford it, even though he can. When he grew up, money was always a problem. His parents were always fighting about money and they ended up getting a divorce. He always heard his family screaming about money, screaming about mom not having the money to pay bills. He got to a point where he said, you know, I don't ever want money to be a problem. And this work ethic matched his desire. He said he never wanted to be in a place where he was fighting about that ever again. You have to ask yourself at some point, do I want to think and eat like an intuitively thin person or do I want to be in bondage for the rest of my life? Personally, I remember going to my aunt's house. She died from breast cancer, but I remember going to her house and she had some really good shampoo and really good running shoes and really good products. And you know, I lived in a middle class home and I remember thinking, I don't want to use Pantene shampoo anymore. Like my hair is so much better using nicer products. And I remember saying, I want to be able to afford nicer products. I want to have expensive running shoes that won't hurt my feet and make it easier to run. Another mindset I had is thinking that when I'm sad, food is going to make me feel better. When I was young and I was having a bad day, my mom would say, oh, you've had a bad day, and would take me to, the, to a frozen yogurt shop. So my mom trained me. When I was sad, her first reaction was to take me for frozen yogurt or shopping. So those are some of the mindsets that I have to work on now. To say I'm having a bad day, but I don't need to go into my snack drawer and have a snack. I have to remind myself that I'm only using food as physical fuel for my body now, not for comfort or as a psychological crutch. Life experiences. What are the experiences you've gone through? These also create your mindset. For example, I have a dog named Malty that I loved very, very much. Sadly, Malty got killed in a car accident. So now when my family goes for a walk with our dog, I'm very cautious about how close she is to the road and the cars that are going by. That experience affects a mindset that I have to constantly work on. I have to tell myself not to be overly cautious to the point that it makes me less relaxed on our walks. Lies we tell ourselves. Do you know that you talk to yourself more than anyone else? You need to pay attention to this self-talk in order to identify your mindset. Once you take a look at yourself and recognize where you got your mindset, you can recognize that there's some area of your life that you need to work on in order to change your mindset with God's help. Are you too pessimistic? Are you guilty of self-condemnation? When you're sitting in your car or lying on your bed, ask yourself, what are my thoughts? I actually say them out loud. When you say it out loud, you realize how silly some of those thoughts are, and then you need to replace them with positive thoughts. Let's imagine some of the lies we tell ourselves. One could be, I don't have time to exercise. Is that true? We make time for things that are our priorities. Maybe you lie to yourself again and say, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. The truth is, you can go today. You can feel better if you go. Tell yourself that out loud. Maybe your lie isn't that you don't have time to exercise, but instead you'll say, I don't have enough money to save. That's a lie. The truth is you can always save some of what you have, even if it's a small amount. Another lie is I'll give more money to God once I make more money. The Bible says in Malachi 3, test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. And in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over. So you need to offset your mindset with the opposite thoughts to fill your mind with truth. Replace those automatic impulsive lies immediately with the truth. The world's highest performers discipline their minds, replacing negative thoughts with positive ones. How to get a mindset reset. The first and most important thing to reset your mindset is confidence. Uncertainty breeds a lack of confidence. When you're uncertain or have a lack of confidence, you don't make good decisions. You need to shift your mindset from playing not to lose to playing to win. Although that seems subtle, it's a little shift that makes a big difference in mindset. There are things in your life that rob your confidence and there's things in your life that support your confidence. 
You need to identify the things in your life that cause you to feel insecure when you do them, that cause you not to make moves and not to move forward. Where do you play not to lose? Flip the switch to playing to win. Here are things I do to build my confidence. Number one, spend time with people who build your confidence even when you don't feel like it. I know a guy who owns a large real estate agency and he always taunts me that I won't be able to build a company as big and as successful as his. I call him my balloon popper. Every time I talk to him, he gives me a little bit of encouragement, but then also likes to pop my balloon. It's like two steps forward, one step back with him. Because of this, I'm not going to choose to spend a lot of time with him. Two, watch what you fill your brain with. I never, ever watch the news. I've gone the past 15 years without watching the news because I have found that never once in my life have I watched the news and thought afterwards, well, I feel amazing. Instead, watching the news makes me feel like, wow, our world is going to hell in a handbasket. Even through the pandemic of 2020, I didn't watch the news at all. This is because I don't want to fill my mind with horrible thoughts about the state of the world. It would bring me down, so I avoid it. Number three, find things that fill your tank. Identify the things in life that chip away at your confidence and what fills your confidence tank. Know what builds you up and choose that over and over. I'll give you an example. A while back, I took a trip to Costa Rica and for the first three days, I wore no makeup and wore a slummy outfit. I looked like someone who didn't care much about her appearance and I felt like I was eating a little bit more. Do you know what I realized? My confidence wasn't there. Finally, I was like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I did my hair. I put my makeup on every day. I started wearing cute outfits and I started eating healthier. My confidence was back. You have to figure out scenarios that work for you. I could have chosen to just slum it, but guess what? I did so much better when my confidence was back. Find things that fill your tank. There are things in life that when you do them will chip away at your confidence while there are others that will fill it up. What are things that fill your tank? Is it being healthy? Is it working out? Is it spending time with friends? Is it spending time with family? For me, it's getting a massage or laying out in the sun that really fills my tank. So you've got to figure out right now what you can do that fills your tank. Number four, do things that allow you to be courageous and allow you to flex your courage muscle. I get so tired of people saying, I can't do that. I've gone on an eight-day water-only fast and people say to me, I can never do that. Well, if you say you can't, then of course you won't be able to. We must be courageous. We must flex our courage muscle. In order to gain confidence, you need to step out in courage. My husband surprised me one day blindfolding me and driving me to jump out of a plane. Courage is jumping out of the plane when you're scared to death and having faith that the parachute opens. I was thinking I could never do that, but we were there and I did it. And you know what? I loved it. You can do the same thing. Five, avoid things that rob our confidence. In order to do whatever it takes to build our confidence so that we can take those uncomfortable actions, do the complete opposite of things that take away your confidence. It's that simple. What are things that make you feel good about yourself? Can you reflect on times in the past where you were scared, but you still did something scary and it moved you forward? If so, then do it again. If not, this is your opportunity to change that. Number six. Stop hitting the easy button on everything. Not everything has to be easy. Stop hitting the easy button on things that matter. I don't want to get to the end of my life and say, ah, oh, I lived a good life. I had a good relationship. I was a good mom. No, I want to be outstanding. I'd rather try hard things and fail than hit the easy button on everything. Sure, there are certain things it's okay to hit the easy button on. But for example, fasting isn't easy, but I can find a way to make it easier like keeping busy. You have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. It's not about where you start, it's about where you finish and where you decide to go. I think there are a lot of people that are listening that might think they don't have the advantages in life that others have. And what I'm trying to point out to those people is it's maybe a bigger advantage than you recognize. This is just the time in history when people need to talk about being uncomfortable more than anything. People think they need a particular diet when really their mindset is the only diet they need. Here's uncomfortable. I go to a lot of dinners where I don't eat anything. Everyone around me is enjoying food, ordering appetizers and drink while I'm focusing on the conversation and company. Naturally, people make comments about my lack of food and wonder why I'm not eating with them. I politely decline and explain that I'm fasting 
or let them know that I want what they say to be the center of my attention, not food. I was on vacation recently and the hotel we stayed at had a great pool. We love to just lie by the pool and wait for the staff to bring out the food. However, the pool menu didn't have a salad as an option. It was the wildest thing. I don't know if it was because of COVID, but they had a significantly reduced menu. Every item they had was like nachos, burgers, just junk food. So most people would say, oh, well, there's nothing else on the menu. So I guess I'll just choose the least of all these evils, so to speak. But here's where you can think about your mindset. Do you think you cannot have a better meal just because you don't see it on the menu? What do you need at that moment? This is a service industry and they have a full kitchen so they can serve you. So I asked the guy, do you have any salads on the menu? He said they didn't. So I was like, okay, well that's fine, but I still want a salad. Here's exactly what I want in my salad. I want fresh basil, fresh cilantro, mixed greens, cucumbers, hearts of palm, avocado, and grilled onions. He went back and made me that salad. Almost all restaurants have those somewhere in the back. Whether or not you see it on the menu, you can still ask for it. Again, it's in your mindset. Are you going to believe the lie that they can't make you a salad and just accept defeat? Okay, they can't make me a salad. Or are you going to push back and get them to make you a salad that you love? The other thing is, I sometimes will develop my own drink. For example, I wanted a cup of coffee with fresh coconut cream from a living coconut. Well, the only coconut cream they had, creamy, sugary coconut syrup, was literally laden with nearly 20 grams of sugar per serving. They did, however, have coconut waters and fresh coconuts. I had them make me my own coffee with straight coconut. I asked them to pour out the coconut water and take the coconut from inside the coconut shell. Then I had them take all the meat out of the coconut and brew a fresh cup of coffee, blend it in the Vitamix blender, and then pour it into the shell with a little bit of ice. I made my own exotic coconut coffee because that's what I wanted, and they made it for me. And so again, it goes back to what is your mindset? Are you gonna just go, oh well, I'll just have a coffee with regular cream, or am I going to have coffee with this laden sugar because that's all they have? No, I just keep pushing the envelope until I get what I want. Of course, I always give the people a very nice tip and they are happy as can be to accommodate. Some of you will say, oh well, I don't wanna be a bother. I'm not a bother to any of these people. If you could see when I come down, they're like, oh, Miss Chantel, Miss Chantel, so good to see you, how are you? They're excited to see me. Why is this? Because I've taken good care of them. They've gone out of their way to be accommodating to me. I tip well, and that to me is a win-win. Stop making excuses. Let's talk about how to stop making excuses. People always come up with one excuse or another for why they can't do something. And sometimes you don't know when the appropriate time to challenge people is. How do you challenge people respectfully, but still get the effect that you're after? We want people to be dialed into the idea that they can make their goals happen, but they have to get rid of excuses. I think excuses fall into three categories, social, family and personal, and work. Let's say I'm going to a birthday party and make the excuse that I have to take a few bites of cake or I have to have a drink when everyone else is because it's a party. No, I don't have to. That's an excuse. One time I went to an extremely expensive restaurant for a business trip that serves phenomenal food. Here I was with my grandmother, friends, and business associates all eating this amazing food, family style, but I had previously decided to go on a fast. Even though it would have been really easy to excuse myself, I stood strong and refused to break. An example of a family excuse would be if my husband made a fabulous dinner or my son surprised me with breakfast, and rather than sticking to my fast, I ate to avoid hurting their feelings. The fear is that I can't do that because I can't meet my obligations of being a good wife and mom. That's not true. Quality time focused on my family, not my willingness to eat every meal with them, reflects my care for them. My refusal to eat only affects me, not my time with them. Lastly, we have work excuses. When vendors bring in the donuts and the deli trays, everyone wants to eat. I had to tell vendors to reserve these items for certain days because we couldn't have all these snacks around the office all the time. 
I even got rid of my own snack drawer so I would not be tempted when the stress was high. This is about accountability and a major routine change. Stop lying to yourself that you are any less engaged with friends, family, or peers simply because you are choosing not to eat when you aren't hungry or when you know the food is not good for you. People will still have a good time. They will still feel loved and you are still amazing in whatever role you fill. You have control of whether or not you will make excuses or not but you have to stop lying to yourself so that you will stop making excuses altogether. Extended fasting. Fasting by definition is abstaining from food or drink for a period of time. The term fast in the Bible comes from the Hebrew word sum, literally meaning to cover the mouth, Strong's Hebrew. In the Greek language, it is nestus. It combines ne, meaning not, and estio, meaning to eat, Strong's Greek. This is the kind of fasting we will talk about in this section. We're not fasting social media or television. We're fasting in the true sense, and that is to not eat. Many different religions have some form of fasting in them. I have Hindu neighbors who fast because they feel it creates a tighter union with God. I have Buddhist friends who fast to be closer to God. My father's family is Muslim, and they fast in the daylight hours during the month of Ramadan to get blessings, create self-discipline, and purify their bodies. The fasting we discuss in this section is based on Christian biblical principles. However, if you're a different religion, the principles still work. I absolutely believe that you should fast with friends if you can. Fasting is not easy, so it's very important to have people around you that can encourage, strengthen, and pray with you. I believe that one of the greatest appetites human beings have is for food. It's a strong, natural desire that we deny when we fast. I've talked to a lot of people about fasting, and here are some of the reasons they told me they don't do it. I have really low blood sugar. It's just that my body won't allow me to not eat every couple of hours. I won't be able to function without food. I won't be able to go to work and be productive in my day-to-day activities. If I'm hungry, it will actually distract me from growing closer to God because all I will be able to think about is food. I don't have anyone who is interested in fasting with me, and I can't do it alone. I have a busy social life with parties and work lunches, and people will look at me funny if I'm not eating. Most of these are logical excuses, but they are just that, excuses. Let's break them down one by one. It boils down to this. The main reason people don't fast is because it's hard. At no point do I want you to think fasting will be easy, but nothing good in life comes easily. If you want a good marriage, it's going to require hard work. If you want a successful career, it's going to require hard work. Raising children is definitely hard. Many of you struggle with your weight and will agree that maintaining a healthy, fit body is hard. You get the point. We live in a world of shortcuts, magic pills, and secret sauces. Everyone I know who is successful at anything has had trials, struggles, naysayers, and setbacks. But they didn't give up, and you shouldn't either. I've done a ton of fasting, and it still isn't easy for me. But you need to press on, hang in there, and just keep moving. Anything worthwhile is going to be hard, but worth it. Preparing for your fast. I spent 20 years in church and never heard a sermon on fasting. My first encounter with it was soon after I joined a new church, and the pastor announced a 21-day fast. It was a huge culture shock. The fast, not always 21 days, was something they did every year because the pastor believed corporate fast was something that God honored and rewarded. Because fasting was completely new to me, it wrecked havoc on my body. It conflicted with my thyroid medicine I was on at the time, and I felt miserable. Fasting is like exercise. If you've never done it before, you have to start small. The pastor didn't do anything wrong. In fact, he gave everyone the option to do a shorter fast. But if you've never fasted before, don't try to do 21 days. It's like running 21 miles when you're not a runner. It's a recipe for disaster. Just like anything in life, preparation is key. To prepare for a fast, write down a fasting plan. Whether it's one meal a day or a 24-hour fast, if you don't write it down, you will struggle to succeed. You need to write down when your fast starts and the hour it's going to end so that you don't forget. Later in this section, I'm going to share some example plans to help you get started. Making a commitment is the first step to being successful with fasting. Commitment is a big problem for people in every area of life. Transitioning into your fast and sample fasting plans. 
I mentioned previously in this chapter that I dived straight into my first extended fast head first and it was a disaster. To help you understand how you can build up to a long fast, I created a sample outline. Let's pretend you want to do a five day fast. Week one, start with a six hour eating window for five days, fasting 18 hours per day. Week two, complete one 24 hour fast. I recommend fasting from dinner to dinner or lunch to lunch. So you could start your fast after dinner on Wednesday and eat again dinner on Thursday. Or you could start your fast after lunch on Friday and eat again at lunch on Saturday. Week three, do one 48-hour fast. Week four, do a three-day fast. Week five, six-hour eating window for five days. Week six, do one 24-hour fast. Week seven, do one 48-hour fast. Week eight, do a five-day fast. Feel free to try this in its entirety to shorten it or extend it. Transitioning out of your fast. The longer you fast, the more important your transition out of your fast is. If I just finished a three-day fast, the last thing I'd want to do is eat a big steak and mashed potatoes as my first meal. Your transition should be half the time of your fast. Three-day fast, do a one-and-a-half-day transition. Four-day fast, do a two-day transition. Six-day fast, do a three-day transition. Eight-day fast, do a four-day transition. Be careful with processed ingredients and animal products during your transition. You just finished cleansing your body of a lot of toxins, so be careful of what you put back in. Fats and animal proteins are harder to digest. I even eat fruits and vegetables separately and pair proteins with non-starchy vegetables. Different combinations digest better than others. I don't want you to stress about food combining, but some things are common sense. Having a big old burger and fries and you'll feel terrible. The very first thing I try to eat after I break a long fast is a smoothie that is mostly vegetables. Then I might have some fruit or cooked vegetables. I personally stick to pretty much fruits and vegetables after a long fast. Recently, I was coming off a long fast, and on the first day, I was away on a business trip, and I wanted to eat at two of my favorite restaurants, True Food Kitchen and the Nordstrom Cafe, one restaurant for lunch and one for dinner. And both times, I ordered my absolute favorite dishes, both of which had meat on them. Both dishes sounded amazing, but as soon as they got to the table, I couldn't stand the smell or taste of the meat. I just couldn't eat it, and I'm not sure why. I just listened to my body and stuck to the veggies. Listen to what your body is telling you that you can handle. Fasting digestion and side effects. It's possible to experience bad breath as a result of fasting. This happens for a few possible reasons. One, your body produces less saliva when you're not eating. That saliva helps you break down bacteria in your mouth. There's less saliva available to do that when you're fasting. The smell can also come from bacteria in your digestive fluids in your stomach. There are also toxins leaving your body while you fast that can contribute to the problem. Keep mouthwash handy and floss more than you normally would. You may also develop a white film on your tongue. Use a tongue scraper or a toothbrush to clean that off. Another big side effect is headaches if you're not having caffeine on your fast. Some people forget to drink water and they get dehydrated. You could feel symptoms of low blood sugar because you're not consuming sugar and your glucose is down. Another side effect is extreme emotions. Fasting doesn't just get rid of your body of toxins. It can bring up repressed emotions that you've been stuffing down. You can no longer hide behind the food and those emotions rise to the surface. You may feel more emotional, hangry, sad, or want to cry. All these are natural and the best thing to do is pray about it go for a long walk, or take a bath instead of running to food. Eating food is a process of digestion, assimilation, and elimination of waste. You have four organs of elimination, your bowels, kidneys, lungs, and skin. No matter how light or healthy the food you eat is, it takes work for it to pass through your gastrointestinal tract and be eliminated from your body. That's why a water fast is so necessary. You have to give your body a break so it can have internal purification. Even if you're a healthy eater, your food can be covered in poisons from pesticides and toxic fertilizers. If you want proof of what I'm talking about, fill a cup with a sample of your own urine and let it sit for a while. You'll see crystals form in it. If you were to have the sample studied, 
they would find traces of pesticides in your urine. Fasting removes these poisons from your body. Knowing that should excite you and keep you going while you fast. You're healing your body from the inside out. Meltdown mode. When I'm fasting most of the time, I have all this energy and clarity and I'm like, this is the best day ever. And there are other times that my staff calls meltdown mode. They can see it in my eyes. I start staring in space. I'm so tired. I have no energy. My staff starts laughing at me because I sometimes I can't complete my thoughts or things I say don't make sense. They will ask if I need coconut water from Whole Foods or what they can do to help. When you're extremely tired during the fast, there are several reasons. Number one, electrolyte and mineral deficiency. You need to have balanced electrolytes. When your kidneys detect that you have a lot less insulin in your body, it flushes water out. You can tell when you fast that you pee a lot because it flushes you out. If you drink too much water, your electrolytes will be unbalanced. So the first thing I will do if I'm being extraordinarily strict is to put some salt in my water if I'm sodium deficient. I will also take these noon hydration capsules. They do have 15 calories and some of them have around 2 grams of sugar, but they have a ton of minerals and electrolytes. Your kidneys excrete minerals from your body to make sure you have the right balance, so you want to make sure you have the right potassium. Whenever I have my meltdowns, I know my potassium is low. When I take potassium and iron, I feel like a new person. Another tip is right before I start my fast, I like to eat foods that are high in potassium, like avocados and potatoes. The seven major electrolytes in your body are sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, calcium, phosphate, and bicarbonate. The three most important being sodium, magnesium, and potassium. So taking an electrolyte tablet when you're fasting is important because when I get in complete and utter meltdown mode and take an electrolyte tablet, it really helps me. The thing that helps me the most is one tablespoon of pickle juice. If I'm about to quit, I take a tablespoon of pickle juice and I'm like a new woman. Two, lack of movement. When you're tired and you don't feel good, you just want to lay down. But that's not going to make you feel better. What will make you feel better is to go for a walk, especially in the middle of the day when I'm in meltdown mode. And going for a walk and getting vitamin D from the sun is the best thing for me. Have you ever gone to the gym? tired and when you leave you actually have more energy crazy how it works fuel transition when you start fasting it takes your body a while to go from burning sugar to fat your body has to adapt to burning fat instead of glycogen for fuel you want your body to be using its reserved fat for fuel when your body is in the transition from one fuel source to the other you get really tired once you tap out of your sugar reserves and start using your fat for fuel that's when you have more energy and clarity and are more alert. It's the transition time for me that can be rough. For me, I know that day two and day three of my fast are very difficult because if you think about it, hundreds of thousands of calories of fat just sitting there on your body. Say you give your body 2,000 calories per day. And the best analogy I can think of is from a show I saw last night where they were serving beer kegs and when one keg was emptied or tapped out, they had to switch to a new keg and serve that. So when your sugar taps out, your body moves to your fat keg, but it takes a little time to switch out the kegs and transition. You can always find a reason not to fast. I forgot about this lunch meeting. I have a party. It's my anniversary. I recently went on a walk with my friend Stephanie and was talking to her about fasting. She said, I want to do some more fasting. The main reason is to lose weight. One of the things that she was worried about is her schedule. Tomorrow she has small group and there are always snacks and she knew people would ask why she wasn't eating them. She would have to tell them she was fasting, which could potentially be awkward. The next day she had dinner planned with someone. The following day, a lunch with someone. I told her that yesterday I went out to lunch with three friends and we went to Aldo's, one of my favorite restaurants in Virginia Beach. I didn't have anything but hot water with lemon. Later that night, I sat with my family while they ate dinner. I've gone to literally hundreds of lunches and dinners where I didn't eat, either because I wasn't physically hungry or because I was fasting. The main thing you have to do is change your mindset. I went in with the mindset that I'm not eating and it's not that big of a deal. I'm going to use this time to spend time talking to my friends. I'm still having fun, still enjoying myself. 
Instead of shoving food in my face, I get to connect and bond with people I enjoy being with. Every once in a while, I will go to another place that my girlfriends love in Virginia Beach called Stockpot. If I'm fasting, I'll get a bowl of chicken noodle soup with no chicken and no noodles and just enjoy the broth. There's a Benjamin Franklin quote I love that says, He that is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. The bottom line is you could literally make an excuse to get out of fasting any time. If you're a busy person and you have a lot of friends, you will have a different excuse every single week on why you're not going to fast, just like my friend Stephanie. She looked at me like deer in headlights when I told her that I go to restaurants and don't eat. Recently, I went to New York City to meet the CEO of another real estate company that took me to dinner at Nobu. My husband took me there in Miami, and without alcohol, the meal was $400. This place is so nice, so delicious, so expensive. It's like celebrity central. This would be a perfect example of a time where I could say, I'm going to break my fast just this once since someone is taking me to a really nice dinner at Nobu. But you can make excuses or you can make it happen. There were about six people at dinner and they were ordering tons of food and passing it around family style. After every dish that was passed around, everyone agreed that it was the best thing they had ever tasted. I was on the ninth day of an extended fast and I was only drinking stabilizing liquids. I ordered some bone broth and it was the nastiest bone broth I've ever tasted. So I didn't really drink it. I ended up just having hot water with lemon. I really focused on the conversation and had a great time. And it was the craziest thing. Even though the food looked great, God took away my desire to eat it. And it didn't even smell good to me. At the time, I was fasting to ask the Lord to heal my body, my autoimmune issues, and thyroid issues. I was also really fasting to take my business to the next level, to bring on high-level leaders and scale our call center to go nationwide. These things are really important for me, much more important than dinner at Nobu. I had decided that the breakthroughs I would get from fasting outweighed a nice dinner out. There is so much more I want to share with you that I just cannot put into writing. I'll be going over this additional information in my new two-part masterclass and brand new video course, which we will putting new content in monthly. Once you finish the book, don't forget to watch the part one masterclass that is totally free to those who purchase the book. Audio learners, there is the audio version of the book available that I narrated myself to help you revisit the chapters so you can really absorb the information. If you're looking for more tools and resources, you can visit ChantalRayway.com. There you will find so many helpful tips and tricks to becoming the best version of you. Are you looking for accountability? Join the Facebook group to get the encouragement you need at facebook.com slash the Chantal Ray Way. Need weekly coaching from one of our certified coaches? Go to chantalrayway.com slash coaching. Below are some of my favorite recipes for you to try out. Remember, you can eat anything you want. This is not a diet plan. It's a way of life. Enjoy. Question and answer. What if I'm plateauing and not losing weight? There are four things you need to do in conjunction with intermittent fasting to lose weight. If you feel like you're stuck in not losing weight, check these things off the list and make sure you're actually doing them. One, use a shorter window. One of the first things I do to escape a plateau is to decrease the length of my eating window. I'll add a few more 24-hour fast days to my week to increase my results. A 24-hour fast is easy for me to do. I can eat a meal at 1 p.m. and not eat again until 1.30 p.m. the next day. That's a 24-hour fast. Two, wait for stomach growl or wait for your stomach to get empty. Don't lose track of getting to true hunger. Your first meal of the day should never come before your stomach growl. There's a very small percentage of people who will be physically hungry but won't hear a growl. Three, Eat when you're hungry. While you may not wait for a stomach growl to eat your second meal of the day, you should still be waiting until you're actually hungry to eat. We never eat unless we're hungry. Pay attention to your hunger scale. You should only eat your first meal at a one and your second meal at a one or two. Four, no overeating. This is the most important factor that you have to be honest with yourself about. You cannot overeat no matter what. If you're still eating too many calories, you're not going to lose weight no matter how much you fast. 
You should only start looking at calories after you're confirmed that you're doing these four things. Take one week to evaluate what you're eating and what number of calories you should be consuming to lose the weight you wanna lose. You might be surprised by how many calories are actually in the foods we eat. For example, there are 90 calories in just one tablespoon of peanut butter. That can add up if you're not careful. Question, what if I'm reaching the end of my six hour window and my stomach isn't growling? Can I eat? Let's say you waited for your stomach to growl and you began your eating window at 12.30 p.m. Your window ends at 6.30 p.m., but maybe your stomach hasn't growled by the time your family is eating at 5 p.m. Let's go back to that hunger scale. For the very first meal, you need to be at a one before you start your window. At your next meal, like the 5 p.m. family dinner, you can be at a two and eat something really small. This way your stomach doesn't growl just after your window closes, leaving you feeling tempted to eat. Question, what if I like to have coffee with cream in the morning? If you're the kind of person who lives for their coffee with cream every morning, you're going to have to make an adjustment for a little while. It is possible to have coffee with cream and no sugar every morning and still get results. If you decide to do that, just know that you may not get results as fast as someone else. This is because you're elevating your blood sugar when you drink that cup of coffee. I personally recommend you don't do it. However, if that is the one hang up that's keeping you from starting this plan, then keep your coffee with cream. To be honest, when I was interviewing all the thin eaters, almost all of them had coffee with a little creamer. Some had it black, but most had it with cream, no sugar. Whatever you decide to do, it's best to wait and drink coffee three to four hours after you wake up or at least until you start getting hungry. Caffeine is an appetite suppressant, so when you drink it, it pushes you so that you can fast a little longer. On days when you're fasting but you feel like you just have to eat, that's when you drink the black coffee or unsweetened tea. Coffee can be very high in acid, so people who have a lot of digestive issues should try a low acid coffee or just drink water if you have stomach acid issues. Once I break the seal, I get out of control. Once I have one chip, I have to have 20. Once I eat one french fry, I'm going to eat the whole thing. What if I don't know how to stop eating? Answer, the reason you're out of control is that you've deprived yourself of these foods you want and you told yourself these are quote bad foods. Yesterday I went to Ocean Breeze Water Park with my family. One of them got pizza, one got a hot dog, one got french fries, and they all got ice cream. I asked my husband for one bite of his pizza, and it tasted disgusting. It was the worst thing. Then I had a french fry, and I thought, these are the worst fries ever. It was very easy to stop eating. The most I ate was three bites of ice cream. That goes back to the rule of decadent foods. Just have a few bites. The point is this. If I didn't have that stuff, I would have been sitting there thinking, I want that pizza. I want those fries. Instead, I had one bite of them and thought, ugh. I decided the food was so disgusting that I wasn't going to eat. I wasn't starving hungry, so it wasn't a problem. I've decided that I'm only going to fill my body with things I truly love. Why am I going to waste my calories on foods that are just eh? Question. I have low blood sugar. Can I do intermittent fasting? Answer. I have had a major problem with low blood sugar, so I absolutely understand what it's like. I woke up this morning not feeling well, so around 8.30 a.m., I decided to take my blood sugar. It was 63. Anything under 70 is considered low, and when you're fasting, your blood sugar should be between... I don't feel good when I'm in the 60 to 70 range. Now remember, I'm not a doctor. And this entire book is based on my personal experience and what works for me. This is just my personal advice based on someone who's had low blood sugar for a very long time. Consult your physician before making any change to your regular eating habits. One, get a monitor. First, you need to find out if you indeed have low blood sugar or if you're constantly spiking and crashing because of a high sugar diet. Get yourself a monitor and test your blood sugar. If this is truly a problem for you, then you might want to eat smaller meals so that your stomach growls sooner and you can eat again. Two, move around. Typically when you exercise, your blood sugar drops, but I have found in my own experience that when my blood sugar is really low and I exercise and have some caffeine, it actually goes back up. 
Do a little research and you'll find other people have similar reactions. Three, drink unsweetened tea. Like I said before, I woke up this morning with my blood sugar at 63. I got up, walked around the house, and drank a glass of unsweetened tea. By 11 a.m., my blood sugar was 104, which is actually considered pre-diabetic. I went to Lucky Oyster later and had egg whites with spinach and onions, as well as an egg and cheese biscuit with half of the biscuit removed. 20 minutes after that meal, my blood sugar had only risen to 125. That's pretty good for it to rise that much after eating a whole meal. Unless your blood sugar is below 70, you shouldn't be eating when you're in your fasting window. Look, you're talking to the low blood sugar queen. If I can do it, so can you. You just have to check your blood sugar to see where it really is. Also confirm you actually have a low blood sugar problem and that you aren't just addicted to sugar. Question, I wanna try intermittent fasting, but I have low blood sugar. Can I go that long without eating? I had low blood sugar as well, so I absolutely understand what it's like. The crazy thing is intermittent fasting will actually help regulate your blood sugar. If you hang in there, you'll notice it gets better. If you begin intermittent fasting while having blood sugar issues, you'll need to do a good job of gradually weaning yourself off of a long eating window. You may have to start with a 12-hour eating window, then step it down to 11, then 10, and so on. Intermittent fasting's effect on blood sugar is really fascinating. Question. I'm really concerned about doing intermittent fasting because I have low blood sugar. I'm afraid I'll pass out. First, you need to determine if you actually have low blood sugar. If it's just a fatigued feeling and not a doctor's diagnosis, it's probably what you're eating that makes you feel lethargic. If you eat a huge carb-heavy lunch, it'll raise your blood sugar so high that when it comes back down, you crash. Adjusting how you eat is important. More protein and fewer carbs are how I like to eat with intermittent fasting. Question, aren't you going to eat so much more when you're in your eating window? Answer, in the beginning, I think you will. You have to remind yourself not to overeat. However, one of the benefits of fasting is that it gets you out of the habit of eating just because it's a certain time of day and into the habit of eating only when you're hungry. It gets rid of the I'm bored snacking habit. That was a big deal for me. You have to be careful not to eat out of boredom, even if you are in your six-hour eating window. Question, what if I'm not seeing results? If you're not seeing results, the first question you need to ask yourself is, what am I drinking? Are you drinking Diet Coke, coffee with cream, flavored water with sugar in it? These are little things that can slow your weight loss. Believe it or not, they spike your insulin, and that's something you don't want to do. Keep in mind that losing weight takes time. I didn't lose anything for the first two weeks. That's why I don't recommend weighing yourself on a scale every day. Only weigh yourself once a week and at times when you're feeling really thin. Weighing yourself every day can discourage you. Does this diet include a vegan option? If it doesn't, I'm not trying it. If it's not vegan, it can't be healthy. Answer, as long as you're following these other rules, you can be vegan if you want to be. Remember, the Chantal Ray way is not a diet, so you can eat whatever you normally eat, and that includes vegan. Genesis 9 makes it perfectly clear that you can eat meat, but if you feel you need to be vegan, then that is perfectly fine. The Bible tells us to be tolerant towards each other in what we eat, Romans 14, 5. How does the fasting window begin? If you're having trouble figuring out the beginning of your fasting window, remember that you're free to determine when you start and stop eating. The second you start eating, you're in your eating window and you are considered to be in the fed state. Your eating window is closed the minute you stop eating and the fasting window begins. I talked to a girl this weekend who told me that she wakes up in the morning starving but is not a dinner person. If you're like that, you may want to do a 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. eating window. That's fine. That's your eating window. Your window is closed when you eat your very last bite. Now, some people argue that when your fasting window begins, you're not really in a fasted state. For example, if you finished eating at 2 p.m., you're not immediately in a fasted state at 3 p.m. because your body is still fueling itself off the food you just ate. That's true, but it's not what we're talking about for the fasting window. We're dealing with the time you're eating versus the time you're fasting. You get yourself to the fasted state by waiting until your stomach growls the next day. It's an accomplishment when your stomach growls because now you're really starting to burn fat. Question, what if I'm required to take food with my medication in the morning? Answer, 
Obviously, you'll have to break your fast in the morning, so you'll need to find something that will not cause your insulin to spike. Look for a high-fat food, something with cream or a lot of butter. An egg is good as well. The yolk is very high-fat, low-carb. I would eat anything that I could think of that was high-fat and low-carb, and I would eat as little of it in the morning as I could. Then I would wait for my stomach to growl before eating again. I definitely wouldn't try to have a whole meal. I wouldn't stress about it, but I would just make sure I had enough in my body so the medicine wouldn't mess up my stomach. Question, what about body odor? Answer, I had a friend tell me that once she started fasting, she was getting more intense body odor. She said her armpits and breath smelled more. That is just a matter of your body detoxing. Use a lot of mouthwash if your breath smells bad. Carry an extra deodorant with you in your purse for your armpits. It gets better, but right now your body is trying to get used to it. It may be kind of unpleasant, but you should really look at it as something that's good. It means you're doing a good thing for your body. Also, it causes an unexpected positive side effect. More showers. If you have a problem with eating impulsively, showers and baths are really good for you. They de-stress you. If you're having an issue with body odor, use it as an opportunity to bathe instead of eating and increase your weight loss. Question, what if I'm not losing weight doing the eight hour window? Answer, I've found that women have a hard time losing weight if they're only doing eight hour eating windows. It's not enough fasting time and they're usually eating too much at each meal as well. If you're working out though, there may be another explanation. You may not be losing weight on the scale, but your body composition could be changing. Take me for example. I'm such a muscle builder. My mom used to smack me on the butt and call me the rock of Gibraltar because I'm just a solid piece of meat. There's a lot of muscle in my body. So I have a jacket that I used to never be able to clasp both buttons, but now it fits just right. I'm not seeing the results when I get on the scale, but these other signs let me know my body is actually changing. Ultimately, you want to change your body composition more than you want to lose weight. Question, are artificial sweeteners harmful? Answer, here's the bottom line. You will not get the best results if you consume artificial sweeteners. The biggest area of struggle for most people is drinking water. I have so many friends who say they hate water. They never drink it unless it's zero calorie flavored water. However, I believe that when you do something for a few days, you just get used to it. For example, I used to always need some sort of Splenda in my tea because I thought unsweetened tea was disgusting. Now I can drink my tea with no sweetener at all. It's something you'll get used to. Question, <clears throat> can I have artificial sweeteners during my eating window? Answer, once you're in your eating window, you can have them as much as you want. Do I like it? No. For me, artificial sweeteners are not good and I'll never eat them. I don't like the way they taste and if I'm going to eat something sweet, I want it to be real sugar. If you want to eat them, you're free to do so, but your results won't be as good. If you do a web search on the effect of artificial sweeteners on blood sugar, you'll see competing results. I think it varies for every individual. Forget the studies and try it for yourself. If you're considering having artificial sweeteners in your diet, check your blood sugar before and after having them and see what happens. Are you getting enough calories when you eat one meal a day? Answer, I'm sorry, but my aunt weighs 90 pounds and she is never worried if she's getting enough calories. You're not going to ruin your metabolism by eating one meal a day. That's a myth. You need to get this sort of thinking out of your mind. You are not overweight because you don't eat enough calories. Let's be honest with ourselves. That excuse is ludicrous and it came from the diet industry. I'm not seeing my weight change on the scale. What's wrong? I learned about something recently called the whoosh effect. It explains why you don't always see a consistent change in your weight every day while you're burning fat. Because of the law of thermodynamics, burning more calories than you consume results in weight loss as your body gets the energy it needs from your fat reserves. This isn't a theory, it's actual physics. If you don't give your body food, it has to use the fat in your body. So you may wonder why you can go a whole week and not lose weight when you know you were burning fat. That's where the whoosh effect comes in. It has to do with water retention. The idea is that your fat cells become filled with water as you're burning fat. Because of this, the scale doesn't change even though you did in fact burn fat. However, once your body finally drops that water, maybe one to two weeks later or more, depending on the person, you lose a bunch of weight at once. That's called the whoosh effect. 
It's like the sound of your pounds being flushed down the toilet. Get it? It's not that you actually lost that many pounds overnight. It's that your weight loss finally caught up with your fat loss. I didn't lose any weight at all during my first two weeks of doing this plan. In my third week, I lost six pounds, and in my fourth week, I lost four. Whoosh. I lost all this weight. That's why I don't like getting on the scale every day. You're getting yourself worked up for no reason. Here's what I suggest as a better way to try to measure your weight loss. Get a pair of pants that you don't ever wash or dry and try them on regularly to see how you're progressing. I even prefer this method to measuring your inches with measuring tape. When you use measuring tape, you have to be sure you measure the exact same spot and pull the tape just right every time or your reading won't be accurate. Question, I'm doing intermittent fasting and now I don't feel well. What am I doing wrong? Answer, don't make the mistake of overdosing on the wrong foods just because you're allowed to eat whatever you want now. I've seen a lot of people who are eating really clean, but then went the opposite direction when they started intermittent fasting. Your body isn't going to feel well if you do that. This is why I focus on eating clean foods even if they're not, quote, healthy. I know I have a high-fat diet. I don't worry about fat. I eat nuts that are high in fat, steak with butter, and all that stuff because the more fat I eat, the better I feel. It's chemicals that I stay away from because I like to feel my best. How do I know if I'm getting enough nutrients in my body? Answer, I take a lot of vitamins because I feel the food we eat doesn't have as much as I need. Visit ChantelRayway.com slash vitamins. Question, what are your thoughts on having a cheat meal? Answer, I don't call it a cheat meal because I eat what I want every day. On my days when I'm not feeling great, I fill my body with super healthy foods to get my energy up. Right now, I'm craving Baker's Crust Gotta Have It Burger. Since I want to keep it a clean day, I'm going to take away the bun and wrap it in lettuce. When I need a lot of energy, I don't eat as many carbs. I eat red meat because my iron levels are lower than the average Joe. So I'm going to have this burger wrapped in a lettuce with some fries for potassium, and that will be my one meal for the day. Question, what are your thoughts on alcohol and wine? Answer, I went to a party last night and someone asked me if I wanted champagne. I told her no because I don't like to drink my calories. I have a ton of friends who do intermittent fasting and they really like to drink. The Bible says that Jesus drank wine, and I believe drinking is fine as long as you don't get drunk. There are also health benefits to drinking red wine. I'm a proponent of drinking wine if the Holy Spirit leads you to. I'm just not a drinker. I probably drink two or three times a year and I don't love it. I actually have this mental block against drinking because all of my years of dieting. It's this thought that if I don't drink my calories, I can have more to eat. I have plenty of friends who are very skinny and would much rather drink their calories than eat them. The main thing is that if you're drinking, you're doing them in your eating window. Go to chantelrayway.com slash wine for more. But doesn't alcohol make you gain weight? Answer. I have this group called Thursday Fun Day Group. I look at how much they eat and drink and they definitely increase their calories with alcohol. However, they are still as thin as they can be. Keep in mind, most of those girls only eat one meal a day and maybe a tasting. Most of them don't start eating before two or three in the afternoon and they stay in that six or eight hour window. Keep looking at the line between eating and overeating. If you are eating and drinking in your window, the alcohol should be fine. Question, what are the benefits of red wine? Answer, there are all kinds of studies explaining why you should drink red wine. They say it regulates your blood sugar. I don't really know because I don't drink it, but if Jesus drank it, I'm not going to look at you negatively for doing it. If you want to be literal, I suppose you could say drink it to be more like him. Ha ha. How obsessive should I be on the eating window? If I start my eating window at 12.06 p.m., do I have to close it at exactly 6.06 p.m.? Answer, don't get obsessive. You don't have to pinpoint to the exact minute. What you want to do is have a consistent window to help you develop a routine, but this should never be stressful. Intermittent fasting is a tool that takes the stress out of your eating. If you start getting obsessive, then you're on the wrong track. Question, if my eating window just opened, but I'm not truly hungry, should I eat anyway? Answer, no. If you're trying to lose weight, you definitely don't need to be forcing yourself to eat. Remember, we eat when we're truly hungry. Question, 
I've read before that you should eat before you get hungry to avoid binging. Is that true? Answer. If your car doesn't need gas, you don't put gas in it. If your bill isn't due, you don't pay money on it. I believe the same principle should apply to our bodies. I get the idea of trying to avoid binging, and honestly, the first couple of weeks of intermittent fasting, you'll probably overeat some. However, you will adjust. Question, what are some tips to not overeat on your first meal of the day? Sometimes my work schedule is so busy that I can't take a break to eat. When I do finally begin my eating window, I'm starving. Answer, stay away from simple carbs and sugar on your first meal. Keep your digestion in mind and eat slowly. You're going to be full 20 minutes before you realize it, so don't rush through your meal just because you're hungry. Another great tip is to drink a glass of water an hour before you eat. This will take the edge off the hunger so you can sit down and enjoy your meal without overeating. In fact, whenever you're feeling overwhelmed by hunger throughout the day, try drinking water. If it's been 45 minutes since your last drink, you could actually be dehydrated. Don't drink a ton of water while you're eating, though. You could dilute your stomach acids and hinder digestion. Question, I'm so tired after eating my first meal of the day. Why am I so exhausted from fasting? Answer, are you eating too much? Why are you eating? It's more likely that what you're eating is the source of the problem rather than the fasting. If you're eating whole clean foods, I have a hard time believing you're constantly tired, but perhaps you're having an underlying health concern like anemia. Always stay in touch with your physician when you make any major change to your eating patterns if you have a health condition. Question, I don't have enough energy to work out in my fasted state. Answer, There are a lot of possibilities. Are you getting enough of your proteins, carbs, and fats? Are you getting enough sleep? Maybe switch your workout time to be closer to your eating window so you can eat right after or eat right before. I personally like to work out fasted, but everyone is different. Question, are you allowed to lift heavy weights while fasting? Answer, I lift heavy weights every single morning in a fasted state. I've lifted heavier weights fasted than men in my gym. My trainer, Chris Sykes, tells me he does all of the same workouts he did before he started intermittent fasting, and he hasn't lost any steam.